So just let us know and keep us posted. Welcome everyone to our afternoon session. I am so glad that you're here for Scholar Day at A. Um, let's see, my name is Elizabeth Beard and I'm an associate professor of English and I'll be the in-room moderator today. And thank you. Um, my name is Ginger Jones and I am a professor of English at LSUA and I will be serving as your Zoom moderator today. Absolutely. All right, and we are both super excited that you're here. If you have any questions, let us know. Um, uh, and I also want to encourage those of you in the room, if you have any questions for the presenters after their presentation, we'll have a brief moment for that after each presentation. It doesn't have to be a literary question. It can be a connection to personal experience or something they brought up that interested you or that connects to your field of study. So um, we'll have a little bit of time for questions and answers and conversations after each presentation. All right, I do want to remind everyone, if you haven't done so already, to please sign in on the Scholar Day link or app so that we know um, we have the full record of our participation. Okay, um, we're going to start with our first speaker, who is Kadera London. His number for the judges is 700. These are a series of three uh, LSUA students presenting work that they have done, research they have done in uh, a drama course and in a novel course. And all of the essays are about fathers and families. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Cordero. He lives in Baton Rouge. He loves old movies, particularly the Indiana Jones movies, <laughs> which <laughs> don't seem that old to a bunch of us, <laughs> but they do to him. So, um, so all right. Mr. Cadero London, go ahead. Okay. Troy Maxson and August Wilson's play, Fences and Walter Younger and Lorraine Hansberry's play, A Raisin in the Sun, are two African-American men dealing with the struggles of everyday life. Even though they are from two different theater plays, both face similar hardships. Fences and A Raisin in the Sun show audiences what it means to be disregarded because of skin color. Troy and Walter missed out on major opportunities in their lives because they were black. Both of these men believe the world had something against them because opportunities always seem to go wrong. Yet, the way they deal with their issues are very different. Why is this? Is it because of their own personalities? No, it is because of something special, something they continuously overlook, and that something is family. A family is a bond formed forged by blood or memories that could never be undone. In both situations, the primary male characters in these plays have great families that look out for one another and truly love each other. Troy's relationship with his family and Walter's relationship teaches audiences how families can sustain people who experience racial discrimination. Troy was a man with deep psychological issues that were never properly managed. He wanted to move forward and live a better life, but did not know how. Troy kept his feelings bottled up and did what he believed a father is supposed to do. However, this technique only served to alienate him from his family. He ended up doing more harm than good to the people who loved him. Troy's first son, Lyons, constantly begged him for money. Though he did eventually repay Troy, he would often spend the money poorly. Troy did not really care about what Lyons did as long as he was out of the house. Troy would often ridicule his son every time he came to visit instead of giving Lyons advice. Troy's second son, Corey wanted to do something incredible with his life. He had big dreams. He wanted to play sports just like his father had done when he was younger. However, unlike his father, he wasn't pessimistic about African-American success in sports. If only Troy realized how important his involvement was in helping Corey achieve his goals. Brazilian psychology professor Maria Carvello declares parental involvement as a family educational input has been explicitly pointed out and called on as a resource for school success. It is a miracle Corey was able to do well in school at all, considering the inattention from his father. As Cavallo writes, the obligation of parents to actively support academic learning is taken for granted. However, homework becomes a specific means of school cultural imposition over the family and diverse ethnic groups. Troy did not want to be part of Corey's school life at all. Corey tried to get his dad to watch sports with him because he knew his father loved athletics, but his father always pushed him away. Troy never really encouraged Corey. Instead, Troy always brought up their financial struggles. This made Corey resent Troy. 
Eventually, Corey leaves the family to become his own man. Troy's relationships with the women in his family were terrible as well. Right now, his daughter did not know her, her father too well. He died long before she was old enough to get to know him. Rose Maxson, Troy's wife, took care of Raynell and made most of the decisions about her care, as Troy did not know how to raise a child, much less a young girl. Troy's wife, Rose, is the embodiment of sincer sincerity and love in his family. She sacrifices so much for Troy and accepts him and even his anger. She is willing to put up with Troy because he makes her feel better. However, even though this relationship is merely abusive, the couple is close. As one psychologist, Justine Vandlewick, indicates, partners who hurt each other can also have a strong bond. Many do not want a divorce, they want the violence to stop. Though they did not physically hurt each other, Troy and Rose were not always good for each other emotionally. Troy never listened to Rose and he never opened up to her. Rose often corrected his mistakes and she recognized this dominant presence, which was not good for her. Van Lewick explains, the subordinate partner gets frightened and tries to avoid escalations. This triggers subordinate behavior and as a result of this spiral, the power difference grows. Being a peaceful, loving woman did not prevent what would happen next as Troy eventually betrayed her love and trust to sleep with another woman. Rose kept the family together as best she could, but she shut her heart off from Troy. She cooked and cleaned from him, but she never looked at him the same way after learning of his affair. In contrast, Walter Lee Younger in the play Raising in the Sun was not in a poor psychological state of mind like Troy. Walter had a goal. He wanted to create a business, something that his family could rely on for generations. Though he did have his own issues and he struggled hard in his job as a chauffeur, which did not provide enough money for his family. He wasn't up for a promotion like Troy. Walter lost his father and though he lived with his mother, the loss of his father did weigh on his heart. Walter did not have a, role, a real role model to look up to just like Troy did not. There were plenty of times where Walter was so frustrated he did not know how to express his feelings. His mother, Lena, was the deciding factor that changed his life in comparison to Troy. Ruth is Walter's wife and his pillar of support though he does not see it. He spends most of his time being angry with her. Every time they talk, they end up arguing, and they eventually start to wonder about their feelings for each other. Van Lewick indicates that this is terrible relationship behavior. A woman like Ruth will want her partner back when he's more friendly and cooperative, and when he learns to stop violent behavior. They need outside help, and this arrives in the form, form of Lena, Walter's mother, who offers Ruth's encouragement. Van Lewick indicates that, in some cases, an abused spouse will receive help from social services over a long period of time without any noticeable change in her situation. Ruth tries her best to make level-headed decisions. She takes care of the house and tries to keep food on the table. At the same time, she is also dealing with the stress of her pregnancy. To other members of Walter's family, the other members of Walter's family are being treated well in comparison to Troy. Travis is Walter's son, and even though he is young, he tries his best to help his family. He wants to work and make money to help out with the bills. However, Walter does his best to make sure that the boy is not aware of the family's troubles. He gives him money even though they are struggling. Travis is one of the biggest driving forces behind Walter's decisions. He wants to give his children a better life than he had. Vinyatha is Walter's sister and they have a bond unlike any of the other characters. In fact, their relationship is completely different from Troy's children. They fight almost every time they are in a scene together. However, when a man tells them they are not welcome to the new neighborhood, they are willing to look out for one another. One of Walter's biggest issues with Vinyatha is that she goes to college and everyone seems to support her. Deep down, Walter wants to be appreciated and supported like any other. Lena Younger, Walter's mother and the head of the household, allows Walter to make the decisions, but she is the one who acts behind the scenes. Lena makes sure everyone, everything is okay with every member of the family. She never hesitates to stop and talk with a family member. She's willing to talk to Walter through his issues. She wants him to see the truth of their situation. She lost her husband, so she does look to Walter to keep his mind focused. She does not want him to live a horrible life. Walter truly loves and respects her. Both Walter and Troy have great families that should make them proud. Each member of their family is incredible and each man has his own ambitions and desires. The respective family members do love each other even though they may not always act like it. Several characters have to go through their own issues but in the end, they remain connected to their families. The writers did an amazing job not only developing two strong black families but also making them feel very real. People go through different situations and this is true regardless of race. Troy ended up living a horrible life, refusing help, and he paid for it and turned to his wife Rose for redemption. Walter started off living a terrible life, but after he hit a low point and looked to his family, the world became much brighter for him. 
Family can be a strong motivator and foundation that people are willing to put in the time to look out for one another and nurture each other. Wow. Any questions? It was wonderful, Cordero. Um, anybody got any questions? From the audience, maybe? Cordero, I, I really am interested in the different fathering sort of attitudes toward fatherhood that you share, specifically in terms of the financial strain, right? One, that's all he could talk about, and the other tried to protect his son from that knowledge, right? Um, what would you say in terms of, because you, at the end, you sort of say each of them sort of learned this dependence on others in the family. What would you say is that sort of dynamic character growth that happens? Um, the, the, the sort of lesson that we maybe could take home from the, the sort of growth that each of your um, Troy and Walter Lee experienced? Well, I believe everybody can learn one very important thing from this and that's just to learn to, you know, depend on one another. Don't be afraid to, you know, speak up, which is something that, you know, every, every character should have done whenever they hit a low point. But you really shouldn't be afraid to speak up if you're suffering or struggling in any kind of situation. Troy was dealing with his own demons almost literally and he ended up dying for it. But had he, you know, opened up and spoke about his issues, maybe they could have helped him out. That's an interesting answer. I like that, Cordero. The idea that mm -hmm. there is, it's a, a character flaw, perhaps, to be too... Um, what is the word I'm looking for? Too stubbornly independent, right? Yes. But there's an ab absolute need for family and, and sort of shared burdens, right? In the sharing of burdens, that's, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Great paper, absolutely. Lots of points relevant to, um, you know, family struggles and things that, are, that we're all facing day to day. Very good. All right. Okay. Right. Thank you, Cordero, again. Our, our next presenter is Patrick Weiser, um, which I think is a wonderful last name for him. Um, Patrick is from Kansas City, and he loves beer. He writes a blog about beer or writes essays about beer. Um, his favorite movie is It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> And so if you have a lot of beer, I bet it is. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, okay, Patrick too is talking about fathers and families and this time in the short story, uh, Kafka's Metamorphosis. Thank you. I appreciate being here today. <clears throat> Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis is a short novel about one man, Gregor Samsa, tasked with solely supporting his family by going to a job he hates until one day he wakes to find himself transformed into an insect-like creature, one with the ability of a beetle or a cockroach. How can readers accept the change or metamorphosis from a human being into an insect? One way is to remember that the change is Gregor Samson's life is a metaphor. If we approach this text from a Marxist perspective, we see how Gregor represents the proletariat, one of the lowest levels of labor, and the proletariat's need to work just to live. When the proletariat revolts, society, in this case a family, can be destroyed. <clears throat> in order to understand where Kafka is coming from in Metamorphosis, it is important to know how Kafka grew up, his background. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Kafka was born into a German-speaking Jewish family and was the eldest of six children. Family was considered middle class as Kafka's father was, a, father was a businessman running his own retail business. His father was described as a huge ill-tempered domestic tyrant with whom Kafka never had a good relationship. Kafka's father never accepted Kafka's desire to become a writer and often directed his own anger towards Kafka. Based on Kafka's history with his family, especially his father, the reader, the reader will easily understand the relationship equivalency represented in metamorphosis. 
It is also important to understand, at least minimally, a socialist view of metamorphosis. According to Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, a manifesto of the Communist Party, the proletariat are workers who are reduced to selling their labor power in order to live. And the bourgeoisie is a class of modern capitalists, owners of the means of social production, employers of wage labor. Simply stated, the proletariat are the people going to work every day to support their families and themselves, while the bourgeoisie are the people employing the proletariat. It is important in reading Kafka that he had a certain disdain. It is apparent in reading Kafka that he had a certain disdain for the bourgeoisie, especially in the novella Metamorphosis. A possible explanation for this goes back to Kafka's dis disdain for his father, who according to definitions would have been part of the bourgeoisie or at least the petty bourgeoisie or those who rely on self-employment for wages. The novel explains that Samson's father lost his money about five years earlier and rather than do the work to repay his debt himself, the elder Samsa, Samsa sends his son, Gregor, to work for one of the father's, father's largest creditors. Gregor becomes financially responsible for his father, mother, and sister. Gregor Samsa is the character who goes to, to a job every day, even though he dreads the work. He tells us what a strenuous career it is I have chosen. And there's the curse of traveling, worries about making train connections, bad and irregular food, contact with different people all the time so that you can never get to know anyone or become friendly with them. Samson does not want to go to work, but his family has become so dependent on his income that he has to go to work. He has no choice. A situation representative of what members of a proletariat society deals with in its own right. The mandatory need to go to work, even working at jobs they hate, just to survive and support their families. Society does not praise these people. Instead, it is repelled by them, much like society repels insects. In contrast to Samson's representation of the proletariat society, the reader will see that the unnamed chief clerk from Gregor's work represents the greater bourgeoisie class. The chief clerk runs the show. He is Gregor's boss and therefore part of the ruling class who dictate how the proletariat go about their lives. He certainly has rule over Gregor, evidenced by the clerk's visit to Gregor's home to determine why Samsa hasn't shown up for work. The omniscient narrator asks the question, why did Gregor have to be the only one condemned to work for a company where they immediate, immediately became highly suspicious at the slightest, slightest shortcoming? This is what the bourgeoisie does to employees. They rule them with an iron fist because they care only about production and sales. The fact that the boss would take time from his day to travel to an employee's home because that employee is late for work tells the reader the boss has nothing better to do than rule over his employees. Additionally, when reading Metamorphosis, it is easy for the reader to ascertain, ascertain that Kafka is also presenting the subversion of family values. According to Marx and Engels, that is exactly what the bourgeoisie did to the family. They tore away the sentimental veil from family life, reducing loving relationships to those based on mere money. Gregor's father had failed at his business and is now relying on Gregor not only for financial support just to live, but also to pay off old business debt. Gregor Samsa is a mere cog in a wheel, going to work every day in order to financially support himself and his family. The family members do not have anything but surface relationships as Gregor spends most of his time working. When it is apparent Gregor will not be, not be going to work to earn money to support the family, his family feels betrayed and wants nothing to do with him. As the narrator tells us, then his father gave Gregor a hefty shove from behind which released him from where he was held and sent him flying and heavily bleeding deep into his room. Samson's father then closes Samson's bedroom door, leaving Gregor bleeding in his room, isolated from the family. At this moment, the father has no need for Gregor, who has been reduced to an insect incapable of working and paying the bills. 
This is exactly what Marx and Engels were referring to when they stated that family relationships in a proletariat society deteriorate when they are based solely on economics. Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis is a short novel written for and about the middle working class. Gregor's, Gregor Samsa represents people who go to work every day, toiling at jobs they do not like, just to be able to survive and pay the bills. Gregor's family has become dependent on him as a sole provider for the entire family to a point that has destroyed the family relationships and reduced them to relationships based on only money. Once Gregor Samsa is no longer able to go to work to provide, the, fam the family has no use for him and isolates him until he dies alone in his room. Kafka lived a middle-class life and certainly did not have a good relationship with his father. Both of these aspects of Kafka's life are portrayed in metamorphosis, a poor relationship with his family and the scraping and clawing in a menial job to live. That's it, thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Patrick. Terrific. How many of you can relate to Gregor Sampson? Raise your hand. <laughs> so like, that's why we get a college education, right? So we have some choice in our degrees and we don't feel like a cog in a wheel just working to survive. So uh, Patrick, uh, I, I guess a, a theme in your talk was the theme of dehumanization, how people can be reduced and belittled by a particular kind of economic system. Do, do you think Kafka gives us the, the answer to that? You know, does he, does he hint at how human beings can regain their humanity and live richer and more fulfilling lives? Well, I don't know if this story necessarily does that. I think it tells us, I think it does tell us though that this is what we don't want in our life, okay. right? We don't want our family relationship or any relationship to be reduced to, to monetary value is all. I think that's what the story is telling us to, um, to not let that happen, I guess, to, to go beyond that with your family. Don't, uh, don't let it be reduced to this kind of relationship. Thank you, good. Absolutely. Great reading voice too, by the way, Patrick. Thank you. Any other questions? Or, a yes, comment. a comment, so I'll repeat. Um, I'm sorry, I just thought that it was, um, like when I was describing it, the word isolating came to mind. And so was that, I guess it is a question. That was a common theme in your writing about how isolating it must feel to be regular or whatever his name was. Um, the one working for that family, being the only one providing for the family, all that pressure and how isolating that must feel, you know? Um, uh, probably you couldn't hear that. What's your name? Carly. Carly is asking or commenting um, that she heard a recurrent theme of isolation and isolating and how uh, isolated Gregor must have felt with the pressure to be the sole provider for that family and how he was really an outcast when he no longer performed that function. Um, so you just ask if you could comment on that theme a little bit. I, I think she's exactly right. And I think, I, I personally think that's part of the whole in the story where he's, you know, they portray him or he's portrayed as an insect-like creature, I think is kind of part of that. You know, he's, he's been reduced to, to just the money provider and his family. He's nothing more important to him than that. And just being an insect, I think, kind of represents that, well, you know, you're really no good to us, or we, won't, we don't necessarily want anything to do with you, other than the fact you're giving us some financial support. So I think, I think that theme of, you know, being isolated based on that is, is true. Um, and I think the fact that he was an insect-like creature and trapped in his room, and, you know, I think, I think all ties into you know, being isolated from his family emotionally and, you know, portrayed as an insect. I think it all ties together. Excellent, Patrick, and, and great point, Carly. Thank you for that. All right, very good. Two excellent presentations so far, thank you. Okay, well, we have two more. <laughs> Keep One it going. Is, um, Everybody may uh, have their cell phones all um, yeah, we're reminding the folks in the room, turn your cell phones off, just so no background noise. Thank you. We're good to go. And if you're not presenting, go ahead and mute if you're online. Okay. 
um, Cordero, uh, Cordero, Arturo Contreras is from California. Um, he loves gardening and he and I share something. We have the same breed of dog. Um, and we, we know that's always when we Zoom, our dogs join us many times. Um, he loves fences and shells. Did I get that right? I think it, I can't read my own writing. Sheds, he builds sheds and fences. That was it, that was it. Cause he's, <laughs> he's an excellent builder. <laughs> And I'll tell you more about that after he, after his talk, which is also about a father-son relationship. Okay, Cordero. Arturo. I mean. <laughs> um, uh, the, this is called uh, Leaving Ugly Behind. And it's about um, August, Wilson, August Wilson's fences and David Henry Huang um, finding Chinatown trying to find Chinatown. The theater plays Fences by August Wilson and the theater play Trying to Find Chinatown by David Henry Huang share an interesting dynamic between their corresponding protagonist and antagonist. Both protagonists build fences to protect themselves from the ugly world. And both protagonists also use strong language against their antagonist in order to manipulate them. But each antagonist rejects their respective main character and breaks free of them. In the end, both protagonists stubbornly stick to their views while their antagonists are forced to leave the protagonist behind in order to find fulfillment. Troy Maxim, the father in Fences, does something symptomatic of people who feel hurt or attacked by a world they cannot control. He builds a fence, both metaphorical and physical. Troy builds a fence around his home to keep things he could not control out, but he also builds a metaphorical fence between himself and his son, Corey. Mary Bugamil, who wrote Understanding August Wilson, felt that Troy built a, a wall between himself and his son, Corey, through his denial of, of a father's affection and a refusal to sign Corey's football scholarship recruitment papers. A wall was Troy's way of keeping his son Corey safe from racism, but it was also his way of exerting power over outside forces, specifically racism. Ronnie, the main character in Chinatown, did something similar to the young man, Benjamin, who, was, who asked Ronnie for help in finding the local Chinese neighborhood. Ronnie refuses to help Benjamin find Chinatown because he feels the request is racist. Ronnie tries his best to separate himself from Benjamin. He built as many walls as possible between them uh, to keep himself safe from what Ronnie feels is discrimination. He attacks Benjamin after Benjamin calls his violin a fiddle by culturally separating himself from Benjamin who had the country accent. Ronnie says, if it was a fiddle, I'd be sitting with a cob pipe, stomping my cowboy boots and kicking up hay. Then I'd go home and fuck my cousin. Ronnie's words were more than just an attack. They were a way to keep a white man away from interjecting in his world. Ronnie, who is Chinese, keeps Benjamin from judging him by criticizing Western music. Ronnie's first act was to make sure Benjamin knew where the borders were and what side of the fences each was on. Troy and Ronnie's fences have another derivative that they share. Both protagonists have a strong sense of themselves and push back when their world is questioned. In fences, son Corey challenges his father, Troy, by ignoring him when they pass each other on the stairs of their home. When Corey con confronts his father to explain how his behavior is unacceptable, Troy rejects Corey and sends him away. Outside the fences he has literally built, Troy says, yeah, I'm crazy. If you don't get out on the other side of that yard, I'm going to show you how crazy I am. Go on, get the hell out of my yard. This is an outright rebuke to Corey that challenges Troy's behavior and his life choices. Troy uses his fence line to mark his world and reject anything that challenges it. In Chinatown, Ronnie shows similar behaviors towards Benjamin when he challenges his worldview. Benjamin explains how he was adopted by Asian parents and wants to know more about them. But Ronnie, but Ronnie cast him out of the world of his ancestors. Ronnie asked the question, if genes don't determine race, what does? Benjamin, who feels that he is Asian because he was reared by an Asian couple, replies, perhaps you'd prefer that I continue to deny my, 
to, to in denial, masquerading as a white man. Ronnie replies, you can't just wake up and say, gee, I feel black today. This is not as direct as Troy's refusal, but it is nonetheless, but it nonetheless does the job of making sure that Benjamin knew that his perspective was not welcomed in Ronnie's world or his corner of New York. Ronnie did not want to be part of Benjamin's ethnic community. Esther Kim Lee, the writer of The Theater of David Henry Huang, agrees with this assertion and writes that Ronnie rejects the assumption that Benjamin is Asian and counters the argument by describing him, his home and community in terms of musical influence. Ronnie did not want to be fenced in by race, so he fenced Benjamin out. The similarity in the conflict and posturing of each side of the protagonist and antagonist is continued in each story's ending. Benjamin and Corey rejected their respective protagonists, but their, but their rejection led them to find what they were each after. Corey Maxim was angry that his father, Troy, kept him from playing football in the same way Benjamin was perplexed by never getting directions to Chinatown. But it was significant that they each walked away or let go from the protagonist to find the future each was searching. Corey Maxim returned to his father's house, but he did so to let go of his legacy. Corey Lee learned that he needed to let go of all the anger and grow into the kind man his father never was. It was Corey's step stepmother, Rose, who helped him understand that. You can't be nobody but who you are. That shadow wasn't not, nothing but you growing into yourself. You either got to grow into it or cut it down to fit you. These words helped Corey let go of his father's trespasses and encouraged him to be his own person. Professor of English Mary Bugamil says something similar in her book, but with more eloquence. At the end of the play, there is no exorcism of the father figure or his legacy, but rather a communion, communion of the new generation who can now, under the ages of Troy's brothers, Gabriel's transcendent song, reconcile themselves with their past and look to the future. This transition into his own whole person was undertaken by Benjamin in Chinatown as well. Benjamin, a white person who was adopted by Chinese parents, also walks away from Ronnie, an Asian American, to find himself. Near the end of the short play, Ronnie explains that his music does not have to sound like Chinese opera before people like you decide I know who I am. This is to say that Ronnie wanted to distance himself from his ethnicity to find himself. Ronnie tells Benjamin that he also does not have to search out his ethnic roots to know himself. He was trying to convince Benjamin that what he was doing was a fallacy and he should be happy just being who he was without searching out his parental past. However, Benjamin rejected his lecture by simply walking away. The play stage directions tells us that Benjamin stands for a long moment. This is to Ronnie play. Then he drops his dollar into the case, turns and exits right. Benjamin's dropping the dollar into Ronnie's collect collection signifies his final dealings with Ronnie and Ronnie's rejection. When Benjamin found the address to his father's old apartment, he felt immediately that he had entered a world where all things were finally familiar. If he had not rejected Ronnie's worldview that genes alone determine race, Benjamin never would have found himself or felt fulfillment. Fences by August Wilson and Trying to Find Chinatown by David Henry Huang developed the protagonist and antagonist in parallel fashions, despite the fact that these are very different plays. The struggle between those who have been hurt by racism may taint the lives of those around them. It is up to those affected negatively to break free of their influence and look to the world and themselves for better outcomes. The plays may be different, but their messages are the same. We need to look for our own inner peace, our own humanity that exists inside us and leave the ugly past behind. That concludes my reading. Um, thank you for listening. And is there any questions? That was another wonderful, <laughs> another wonderful presentation. Absolutely, Arturo. Just... Kayla, you need to unmute. So very good job, Arturo. That was very well said. But this isn't a question. It's more of a comment. Um, when you were discussing your essay, it reminded me, I don't know if you've ever watched the show Seinfeld, but there was an episode where Jerry stops this Chinese man and asks him where um, a certain Chinese restaurant is. And the Chinese man's like, well, you're asking me because I'm Chinese? He's like, no, I asked you because you're the mailman. 
because I figured you'd know and it just came into this whole big racial thing but I just wanted to throw that out there that it sounded a lot like and I think um Seinfeld gets a lot of their um plays from books and stuff events that's going on so I think maybe that has something to do with that episode I don't know I did just remind me of that episode that was it, exactly, well. it's exactly like what the play is nearly about you know because he has stopped uh, a, a Caucasian man stops or, or talks to uh, an Asian man who is um, busking on the street and wants to know where Chinatown is and so there's this little discussion and interestingly, the white guy is reared by Asian parents. Yeah. So it's it's a wonder. It's, what is race? You know, that's what part of what our Charles essay questions yeah. do. A great line, Arthur, that I loved is when you were talking about that dynamic of the father wanting to protect his son, right? So he did not want to be fenced in, so he fenced or th this was the, um, the uh, Chinatown, but he fenced Benjamin out, right? He didn't want to be boxed in, so he fenced the, um, the seeker, Benjamin, out, but ironically, in doing so, is also boxing himself in to, um, you know, confining racial categories. So it's, I mean, it's just exactly what is race and who gets to decide um, race of designation for the individual. Excellent uh, food for thought and extremely relevant to um, current events. Absolutely. Uh, okay, if there's no questions, we'll go on to um, our final presentation. It's by Kayla Fontenot. I have to tell you something about Kayla. Kayla is a wonderful, she's, she's a lot like me. We, we're, we're ambitious and we wanna get things done and we want to, we pay attention over and over and over again till we get it right. If Kayla is doesn't know something, she will send me an email 50 times until I answer her. <laughs> so, and she's very, she's a wonderful student too. Okay, and Kayla's um, presentation has nothing to do with fathers or sons, but it has everything to do with love. <laughs> All right, Kayla, go ahead. Okay, so um, I have a PowerPoint, so bear with me. I don't think I did it right. Did you open your screen first? Oh, that open might help, first. huh? <laughs> yeah, and then share screen, and then back to, you'll see, when you do share screen, you'll see your PowerPoint on there. Uh, do I share screen on the PowerPoint? No, open, <laughs> is your PowerPoint open? Yes, ma'am. Okay, go down to share screen and mm -hmm. open. And you should, there'll be a group of things that are open on your computer and you sh should be able to click on it then. Host. It says host dis disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, that's me. That's not oh. your fault. <laughs> you learned something. Yeah. Let me see. Okay, now try it. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Perfect. See what I mean about Carl? <laughs> <laughs> so can y'all see that? Yes, Kayla, we're good. We can see it. Okay. So I'm going to introduce myself again. My name is Kayla Fontenot. I'm from Lake Charles, Louisiana. I am a senior this year and an English major. And my presentation is called The Madness of Love. So, answer. He was known as one of the most quoted authors of all time. There are over 300,000 Jeopardy clues referenced to his works. If he were alive today, his plays, his plays would rank number one in the box offices. Anybody in the room? Who's this? Shakespeare. <laughs> if you've guessed William Shakespeare, you're correct. And bonus points that if you knew that in his will, he left his wife 
the only second best bed in their home. <laughs> so. In Shakespeare's lifetime, he wrote a total of 37 plays, which compiled of a variety of comedies, tragedies, and some historical plays. Um, it's clear in each of his plays uh, that there's always seems to be a common topic involved. Within each play, that topic he always seemed to write about, whether on purpose or, you know, incidental, was the subject of love, was always present somewhere throughout his plays. Whether he wrote about a love interest among a young couple, the bonds between a father and a daughter, or the loyalty that was expressed between friends, these concepts of affection, affection excuse me, exhibit a recurring role in each one of his plays. As for my presentation today, I will discuss examples of the love portrayed in As You Like It and point out the affection that is shared between some of the characters. Many of William Shakespeare's plays encourage, I'm sorry, engaged with a similar theme of love. Shakespeare expressed this love theme in many ways, showing the love between men and women, father and daughter, between friends and so on. This recurrent theme is also brought about in his play called As You Like It, where the idea of love is carried on throughout the entire play. In this comical play, the theme of love is important because it's what drives these characters to act the way that they do. Shakespeare really exa exaggerates love as a whole by making these characters fall for each other so quickly and so comically. This play is a prime example of how true love can be expressed between not only the different characters' relationships, but also it shows how he portrayed the difference in the way the male characters and female characters showed love for one, of, one another. Two of the main characters of the play are Rosalind and Celia. These two girls are not only the very best friends, but they're also cousins. When Rosalind's father, Duke Sr., is banished from the kingdom, he, is, he goes away to the forest of Arden. Rosalind is invited to live with Celia and Celia's father, Duke Frederick. Knowing how inseparable the girls are and how, and having the utmost love for his daughter, Celia, Duke Frederick made this decision to let Rosalind move in to prove to Celia just how much she means to him. As mentioned, the female characters in the play express love very differently. Both Rosalind and Celia spend time telling jokes, going to, around, going to events around the kingdom, such as watching wrestling matches, and they discuss with each other their most personal thoughts. When Rosalind is exiled from Duke Frederick's kingdom. Celia will not let her leave alone. She insists on running away with Rosalind to the forest of Arden. Celia's sacrifice she makes to go to this journey with Rosalind shows just how much she loves her and that this sisterly bond that they share cannot be broken. The girls dress in disguise to safely make way to the forest. Along the way, the girls meet a young man whom they discover has no food. On a whim, the girls decide to buy a cottage, pasture, and flock in order to help him out. Typical girls spending, frivolously spending their money and uh, just to help someone out. Their action shows how genuinely caring those two characters are and what a grand gesture they made to prove what big hearts both Rosalind and Celia have. As for the male characters, they show their affection a little bit different. Orlando, 
finds himself in a similar situation as Roslyn. He too is expelled from his home. Uh, let's see. He sets out for the forest of Arden as well, and he's accompanied by Adam, who is a very loyal family friend, and he accompanies Orlando on his journey. And in fact, he puts up his entire life savings to fund the trip. <clears throat> Adam's generous gesture proves to Orlando not only his loyalty, but his devoted service to him. But also, he truly loves Orlando as if he were his own son. Adam, being a rather old man, has difficulty making the trip successfully. He becomes too weak and hungry to continue. So Orlando shows his admiration for Adam by bombarding Duke Sr.'s dinner and urges him to feed his friend. To his surprise, Orlando and Adam get a warm invitation to join Duke Sr. It seems as though the male characters act, act more abrupt and make more rash decisions to show how much they care for each other. This also possesses true as Orlando expresses his love for Roslyn by carving poems in throughout the trees of the forest in hopes that she will see them and fall just as deeply in love with him as he does with her, as he is with her. The first time Orlando saw Roslyn, it was love at first sight. The characters in this play express their compassion and empathy by making grand gestures to each other and showing their loyalty. Shakespeare makes the theme of love very prominent throughout the course of this play with male and female characters using different approaches to express themselves. Shakespeare also shows that love amongst others does not have to be just courtly between a man and a woman, but it can also be shown amongst friends. And something, this quote was in um, the play and it's very true. And it was one of my favorite quotes. It says, uh, men are like April. This is, excuse me, this is Rosalind speaking to Orlando. Men are like April when they're wooing a young girl, passionate, young and passionate, but like December once they're married and their passions have cooled. Women are as sweet and temperate as springtime when they're single, but the climate changes once they're married. This concludes my presentation and I Thank you all for listening, and I really appreciate this opportunity to be a part of this year's LSUA's Scholarship Day. At this time, I ask if you have any questions for me. Good. We have a question back here, and I'll repeat it if we can't hear it. I have a question, but I just have to continue on the Dr. Obama and the college. Um, well, what specifically Tom wanted to get into the Yes. So a big compliment on your PowerPoint and the time you put in <laughs> putting it together. It was fun. It, the visuals were really fun. Were they engaging? Can you guess one of my favorite shows? <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey? <laughs> yep, very good. Any other questions? Comment? All right. Good job, good job Kayla. Absolutely. Good Kayla. job overall. I think everybody deserves a round of applause. Thank you. Kayla's number, by the way, I don't know if I said it, she's 707 and Arturo was 705. I'm not sure I gave, gave out those numbers. I think they got it. it. Yep, they've got okay. it. We're good. All right. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. I appreciate our live audience being here, the, the folks in the room. It makes a big difference to have friendly faces and to have the, um, the response from the audience as opposed to presenting our online guests, wonderful chats going on and responses to the presentations. This has been a really fun day hearing eight super student presentations, um, lots of great ideas um, and um, possibilities to follow up on, you know, thinking about publication as um, Dr. Rowan has encouraged us several times today. Good, thank you. All right, our um, presentations continue in the back in the cafe annex and on Zoom. We'll have some, some theater um, sort of briefs, quick theater performance.